Jennifer Urshere, who is the Executive Director of the Texas Inmate Family Association. And I'm sure you can tell you Tip is celebrating their 20th anniversary this year. Uh, I'm the Executive Director of TIPA, which is the Texas Inmate Families Associ Association, and I'm a lot like Marguerite here, there to support the families and friends of uh, those who have been incarcerated. Uh, we support, educate, and advocate for our families. This is important because but we've been around 20 years, so we've been meeting with TDCJ, working with the young folks, and then we have a relationship with the prison. As unfortunate as that sounds, as we do. Um, and that's the service we offer our family. We not only understand what they're going through, we can help them problem solve when they have issues inside. Because that sometimes, for a mom especially, is the worst thing you can go through, is, not, is being so helpless, not being able to help your child you know, on the inside. As far as education, we teach them how to navigate the system, what to expect, how to talk to um, state officials. We also teach them parole packets. We started a class, we have workshops on how to pro uh, prepare a parole packet so that families don't have to go to that expense of uh, hiring an attorney to do that because the parole board is told us over and over again, you don't have to have an attorney for that. As far as advocating, I'm in Austin, so I spend a lot of time testifying and visiting office down at the state capitol. I work with other groups in Austin. I work with the Texas Criminal Justice Coalition, the ACLU, the Texas Civil Rights Project, all those groups in Austin, to where when they have bills that they want to get through and they need family members to testify, they call me. I'm a retired state employee, so I'm available to, to go downtown and to, to fulfill that, that need. Uh, we have 17 chapters around the state. Uh, it's important that we network, and what the, the power that we have with our chapters around the state is when there's a bill that we need to support, we have constituents that we can call. And we can organize like that. And we're going to really build our, try to organize and build a power base for the next ses session. TIPA also belongs to a national cohort. Uh, we did a letter campaign on Ban the Box where we took letters to Washington, D.C. and presented them to the office uh, of President Obama to let them know that it is not only important to the individuals as they return home, that they get a chance at uh, fair employment, but the families need it as well because we need them supporting their families and um, being a productive citizen in the state. Once again, I'm Jennifer Urshavec, the, the Executive Director of TIPA. I got involved with the situation because my son was in prison. I got him into school. He graduated with an associate's degree. He got out this summer on parole. But during that, yeah, it was very emotional. We've been out six months. We have been out six. He didn't do it alone. It was, it was a family affair. Um, but going down this path, through some of the stuff that I did with Tempa, one, as I mentioned before, was the full packet workshops that we did. Well, during one presentation down at the Darrington unit, I presented to the seminary school there. And um, I can't tell you how hungry people are on the inside for information from the outside. Um, so it was just an inspiring moment for me, and now I can't leave the system. They asked me, some of the field ministers, they're now field ministers out there. Uh, they graduated from the seminary, they're ministers, and they have been dispersed throughout the state. They asked me if I would be interested in helping them change the laws as to when they would be eligible to be reviewed for parole. They wanted to know if their good work in the seminary could be counted towards their eligibility, and that's all they were asking. 
if due diligence, their due diligence and their good work would help them be paroled. Now these are all guys with very long sentences because that's what's required to get into the seminary. It's a free program. But I want to know if a field minister inside a prison can do good work there, why couldn't he do the same good work in our communities? And I can't see any reason for them to deny these wonderful people. They did make a bad choice. But they are they have changed people can change and that's the point so what can i do to help these men these these ministers come up before the parole board and so that's what i'm working on i'm working on due diligence for 3g offenders which are the violent ones we have to think about separating out the people who need to stay in prison and those who can really change and age out of criminality. I'm working on a second look. If you were under the age of 25 and committed a crime, you were a different person than you are now at, say, age 35. There's a different, there's a science to it. They've all changed. My son was 21 when he committed his crime. He changed at 25. He's now out. He got out in June. Three weeks later, he had a job, and he hasn't looked back since. He can change. So can others. So these men and women deserve a second look. They don't need these 40-year sentences, these life without paroles, and that's the next thing I want to talk, talk about is life without parole. Recently, the state of Texas, in 2005, they, they decided to take the death penalty off for some of the capital crimes because they felt it was easier to get a conviction if they could put life, off, life without parole on the table instead of the death penalty. So this was trying to step back from the death penalty. What happened was, more often, people were getting convicted for life without parole. We went from five people in prison to 763 people now serving life without parole in 10 years. 44% of those people were convicted under the age of 25. 41% were African American. So if you want to talk about disparity and a, a cruel and unusual punishment, let's talk about 20 year old never ever having the chance to even come up with the law. Those are the people I think we should take a second look at and consider sentence reduction for those people. And then the last thing that we, TIFA, and our associates, because that's part of what I'm doing here tonight, is I'm networking with you guys because I need your help. We are going to look at uh, compassionate release. For those people over the age of 55 who are sick, can no longer do anything, and their families want them to come home. The state pays an exorbitant amount of medical expense to keep those people in the hospitals. They use a lot, up a lot of the hospital beds, and they cost the state a lot. So let's have a reasonable look at those who those people are and bring them home. So that's what we're looking at with Tempa. Okay. I think I had a minute left over though from the first time. <laughs> I think so. so. So what I'm doing is networking with people because I'm going to need your support. I'm going to need you as constituents to contact your, your representatives and your senators. I need you to tell your story and I need y'all to understand. I need you to learn your facts to be honest with yourself about what's going on and be able, and not be shy to visit those offices. They really, really do want to hear from you. They do. So I encourage everybody to study as much as you can on the issues and network with us and come together and help us solve these issues around criminal justice.